Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca. Ithaca, New York boasts an authentic craft beverage experience, tasty farm-to-table culinary adventures, and scenic outdoor recreation among 150 waterfalls. Plan your trip today with help from visitithaca.com. Hey, this is Luke, host of Bushwick Podcast here on Heritage Radio Network. Before joining HRN, I was a fan. For the past 10 years, HRN has been sharing the most original and innovative stories on food and culture from around the globe. While the staff and hosts make it look easy, it's hard work, especially with limited resources. As an independent, member-supported nonprofit, we rely on listeners like you to help us share the very best. Personally, I'm honored to be a part of Heritage Radio Network, and I invite you to join us in our mission to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. Help us start HRN's second decade stronger than ever by becoming a member today at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. You can even show your love for Bushwick Podcast by selecting our show from the designation drop-down menu when you sign up. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening to HRN. I'm Luke Griffin, and you're listening to Bushwick Podcast, local stories like you've never heard before. Each week, we take you behind the scenes of the artists, activists, and entrepreneurs whose journeys collide in Bushwick, a special Brooklyn neighborhood that's changing faster by the day. June is Pride Month, which means the people around the world are gathering to honor the LGBTQ community with parades, parties, and celebrations of all kinds. Bushwick is home to one of New York's more dynamic LGBTQ scenes, and while the neighborhood holds events throughout the year, this month has some surprises, like the latest showcase from Bushwick's very own queer feminist theater company. That's unique. It can be scary. It can be rewarding. It can be very intimate. I joke about a closed orgy, but it is almost as vulnerable and exciting as any sort of intimate connection. And you're having that with nine people in a cast. And then eventually 25, 50, 100 people who show up to a show. That's wild and exciting and electric. And the reason the theater is the theater and the reason the queer theater is the queer theater. This week, we're quite literally going behind the scenes to learn more about how one of Bushwick's most unique performance groups is reimagining theater to build a space where everyone belongs. It's Thursday, June 20th, and this episode is called Word Made Flesh. And a heads up before this week's episode, it does include a bit of strong language. Here we go, take a walk on the space. So, my dears, where is your body today? Last month, we joined a group of performers as they gathered to do something unusual. On the second floor of a nondescript old building, in a sparse room with wooden floors, chipping paint, and walls lined with full-length mirrors, they gathered in a circle. At first, they just talked, a little about astrology, and then about some positive developments in each of their days. As the discussion died down, they scattered throughout the room, transitioning into the exercise that they'd come there for. From the corner, a director called out instructions. Not commands, but something like suggestions, to do things in the room that had never been done there before. 
The performers followed with what at first looked like a series of stretches or yoga moves. But soon, they evolved into what could best be described as an emergent sense of shared movement. People began mimicking one another and then touching one another. And then finally, collapsing into piles together in a kind of slow motion wrestling ballet. But as quickly as it started, it was over. Here in this moment, feel that all that work was because of you. All that work lives in you. It can be contacted in a second. It can be contacted for 20 hours of work. All of it is in you. Thank you. Thank the ensemble, thank the space, and thank yourself. And your own time, and take your time. Relax. Believe it or not, this whole sequence was actually just a warm-up the prelude to a rehearsal for a new kind of theatrical performance called Scorch the Pot that's set to take place here in Bushwick tonight on the evening of June 20th. And it's all part of a special theater company called Sacred Circle Theater. Theater, of course, with an R-E. So Sacred Circle Theater Company is a queer feminist theater company, and that means a lot of things. We are a theater company that definitely is a theater company, but also uses frameworks from all sorts of other things, dance, movement, radical theory, radical gender theory, uh, feminist theory for certain, um, to create theater that centers around queer and trans people and also queers the work of making theater. So queering... Queer theater that's made in a queer way. Yes. That's well put. That's Sacred Circle's founders, Raymond Arnold and Milo Longenecker. My name is Raymond Arnold. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the company leader of Sacred Circle. I'm Milo Longenecker, he, him, or they, them, and I am the senior artistic associate and co-founder of Sacred Circle. I am also one of the co-founders. These are the two. As co-founders and as partners, Raymond and Milo make an interesting pair. Raymond was the one directing the group's rehearsal, and if you couldn't tell, in person, he's gregarious, animated, and extroverted. That's the only thing we know in America. Every American art form has been, I don't know, don't plan it, right? And that's very part of being queer, and I, we could talk about how all American art is queer. Milo was one of the actors warming up in that rehearsal. They're a bit soft-spoken, thoughtful, and unfailingly cerebral. And having time and space that is yours to fill, that's all I really want as a performer is, is are you crying? I'm sweating. <laughs> it is very beautiful. Uh. We sat down with Raymond and Milo as they prepared for tonight's Scorch the Pot performance to learn the story behind Sacred Circle and unpack the company's ambitious goals here in the community. In order to understand Sacred Circle, you first need to understand what they mean when they describe themselves as a queer theater. Most people, I think, know know that it used to be a slur, right? It used to be a thing lobbied at LGBTQ people in some way that was demeaning. It's not anymore, right? Or perhaps not everyone would say that, but most people would agree that queer is a term that has been reclaimed, and in its reclamation really seeks to say that a queer identity, which would probably mean anybody on the LGBTQ spectrums, a queer identity is all about, I contain lots of possibility, both sexually, both in my gender, but also as a human being that I want to explore. It's important to note here that Sacred Circle approaches the concept of queerness with a more radical outlook than comparatively conservative definitions, which juxtapose queerness with straightness. For the company, Queerness is a spectrum along which we all exist, and the very idea of straightness is something to be questioned. Part of a radical queer understanding of the world, some might say, not everyone, some might say that queerness seeks to question anyone's straightness, right? Can straightness exist in a queer world? Because queer as an identity, as a way of being, wants to disrupt normalcy wants to be a little radical, wants to say, oh, no, but there's no such thing as straight people. Or and wants like to, that. in its existence, make others question their own relationship to hegemonic straightness and cisgenderedness, etc. And, and say, you know, why do I feel straight? Where does that come from? And I think that for many people, that's not something that 
has necessarily occurred to them if they haven't been forced to question it. At the heart of Sacred Circle is the belief that theater is one of the most powerful tools with which to explore these questions. Through their work, the company seeks to catalyze what they call an interrogation into the tightly interwoven fabric of identity, performance, and humanity on the part of their performers, but also their audiences and the theater itself. Being a queer theater means that the form of theater, people come, they pay it for a ticket, they sit down, they watch something, there's a script with a director and there are actors and then it's all over, the actors bow and they applaud. That that all might happen, but it's always being questioned. It's always being interrogated as it's happening. I think that's one of the foundational elements of a queer theater. And I think beyond just, can I do it differently? Uh, can I do it in a way that is more and more genuine to who I am in all its multitudes, which is sort of the, one of the central tenets to me, at least, of, of a queer identity. The company's name, Sacred Circle, is itself a reference to their radical queer understanding of the world. A circle being representative of a community and also representative of the boundary around a held space where anything is possible, you know? Um, and it's sacred because... You can't get that a lot of places, you know? I think we're certainly not a, a spiritual community in any sort of formal way, but the experience of working the way that we work has been described by many people as a pseudo-spiritual experience. Mm. Another really important part for me is in the theater, we are creating a sacred circle because we are inviting people in to something that is existing but can only exist with them. So in living in that paradox of it going in both directions, of this is very much a thing that exists and yet is always ever continuing to become, that to me is what a sacred circle is about. The circle is open yet forever unbroken. Even Sacred Circle's logo, an inverted triangle within a circle, reflects the company's complicated approach to the ideas of reclamation and alternative understandings. That logo, the inverted triangle, is twofold. One, the inverted triangle symbolizes the divine feminine, which is important, um, and I think speaks to the neither of us as the leaders of the company are feminine people. I think it speaks to a, an interest in alternative ways of working, right? The reclaiming an alternative away from hegemonic society. That's, I think, what we're talking about when we talk about the divine feminine. And it also invokes the inverted triangle that was used to mark queer people during the Holocaust, which then be also became reclaimed by the queer movement to be a symbol of queer resistance. So it is both this reclamation of the divine feminine and the reclamation of queerness that is inherently involved in creating a sacred circle. In the three or so years since launching the company, Milo and Raymond have watched as the sacred circle they've drawn has taken hold in Bushwick, where the neighborhood's LGBTQ and DIY art scenes have been the perfect home for the company's radical ambitions. That comes back to the Bushwick queer scene, it comes back to the Bushwick art scene, and all that it means to be, right now, 2019, artist living in Bushwick and the surrounding areas is... I want to move the envelope. I want to move it along. I want to try something. I want to try something new. I mean, how many people we have who are like, I used to do plays in high school, but I haven't done one in forever, or I've never done a play, or I, you know, I'm a mu really more of a musician, but I'll give it a shot and I'll act. And like, how that has really sparked, not just we're a theater company, but we're this vibrant and very intimate group of artists. The work they're doing within that group is redefining the traditional boundaries between performance and self-expression. Sacred Circle often describes their work as word made flesh, which for some folks may sound familiar. That is, believe it or not, um, I'm an Italian American and I'm Irish American and I was raised Catholic and that is a Catholic expression it comes from Catholicism, and it's the description of Jesus, right? Jesus is the Word made flesh. Now, we're not a Catholic queer theater company, but... Make no mistake. But I think what that's meant to do is to say, word, 
And this is what the Catholics would tell you they mean about Jesus, and it's what we would say we mean about the queer theater, so ha 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 ha. But word, as theory, as idea, can so easily, so transgressively, so magically become flesh, become transmuted, translated, transformed by a body, onto a body, through a body, through a person, through flesh. Word can become flesh. And in that doing, you learn so much about the word, the idea, the theory, and you learn so much about the body doing the theory, doing the flesh, becoming the word, becoming the thing. That when that happens, everything becomes greater than the sum of its parts. It's an idea that plays out in the sense of bringing words to life on the stage, but also in the sense of what Raymond and Milo describe as a uniquely queer and trans experience. That is both the theatrical process, right? I have an idea for a play and we're gonna put the play on and then we're gonna have a director, we're gonna have actors and we're gonna fill it out with body. It's also what audiences do. They come with a, they read the, the thing. And they go, oh, this play called whatever. I'm gonna go see that. And then they see it and there are bodies in front of them. It's also what happens to a lot of queer and trans people. They have internal stuff, they have internal desires, they have internal ways of being that then they have to go, how do I put that into the world? How do I make that with my body? What am I doing with my body to be queer, to be trans, to become the thing that I feel inside? And when I do that, what gets lost from my idea, from my conception, and what gets discovered, discovered in doing that, in creating that? That experience, of course, is multidimensional, and for Sacred Circle's performers, many of whom identify as LGBTQ, deeply personal. The company takes great care to create spaces that allow performers and audiences to experience what Milo and Raymond refer to as a kind of supported freefall. It's why, for instance, they utilize such a unique and involved practice for their rehearsals and warm-ups. And that's really important because that helps to make sure that everyone feels safe and that we're going somewhere. It's not just a clothed orgy. The, if we're gonna have a clothed orgy, that's fine. But it's not just a clothed orgy for no reason. But I think it also has to be open enough to allow for that emerging, that inspirational moment to happen where we're gonna figure it out today and we're gonna get there together and that's gonna be a negotiation. Sometimes even internally that's a negotiation for people. That's a like, how am I gonna get myself to the place I wanna be? How are we all gonna get to the play in the way that we're going to get there today? Which is very of that particular moment. It necessitates that relationship to this is the only moment, this is the moment right now. One of my favorite things that you say sometimes in movement warm-ups is that everything you need is here in this room, in this moment. And uh, I think that's really the, the approach that we take as a company toward rehearsal. I mean, you can't control the variables of the day, but you can show up and empower yourself and empower one another to do the work that you've come there to do that day regardless of what else happened to you before you got there. And in fact, holding space for what happened to each of you that day before you got there. This same spirit of transformation and emergence animates their live performances and defines the experiences they hope to catalyze for Sacred Circle's audiences. That moment of... This was unplanned. Here it is. I mean, that's when the word becomes flesh, right? That's when the idea becomes practice. And when idea becomes practice, you don't know where it's going to no, land. it's transformed. Yeah. It's, and, and that moment is you also uniquely queer and trans, right? Because you can, you can have the idea of how I'm going to be, and then, oh, I, I know I'm this way. And then you get out into the world, and it's there, and you're like, oh, I did not know I was going to be this way. Or, or this is so much more, or different, or exciting, or... Complex. Complex than I was expecting. After the break, we take a look at how this manifests in the work the company showcases at events like tonight's. There is a big theme of the future and sort of the dystopic end of the world as we know it, climate change drags us all under kind of vibe coming. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca. 
Located in New York's Finger Lakes region, Ithaca boasts an authentic craft beverage experience, tasty farm-to-table culinary adventures, and scenic outdoor recreation. As the saying goes, Ithaca is gorgeous. The city is home to 150 waterfalls and gorges sprinkled through its downtown and sloping hillsides. State parks and acres of natural lands offer outdoor recreation for every level of enthusiast. Come stroll among the cool ravines, scenic hiking trails, and natural vistas. Ithaca is home to Ivy Lee Cornell University and Ithaca College, resulting in an influx of new cultures, new tastes, and new energy every year. There's so much to explore, from art galleries and museums to unique attractions like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Ithaca sits at the heart of a blossoming heritage and craft cider industry. Some of these delicious ciders can be bought in market, but many of the most unique varieties can only be experienced with a visit to Ithaca and this great cider region. Go to visitithaca.com to get inspired and plan your trip today. Throughout last year, Sacred Circle had been attempting to reinterpret existing plays in a way that felt more personal and fulfilling. But ultimately, they were left wanting. Last year, we did a double bill of plays written in the 20th century. And it was beautiful in many ways. But Milo and I turned to each other at the end of the year and we're just like, you know, doing pre-written work, work written before now, literally now, literally this year, is just not serving us anymore. Um, The lack of trans characters, making, you know, we had a year making trans people play cis people, and that can be fine. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But we just decided we can't do that anymore. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for you. No. They realized that they needed to pursue work that was more urgent, more contemporary, more innovative. And as they thought through how to put that into motion, they were struck by an unexpected inspiration. Grandma's Sunday macaroni. And in that same effort of queering the way of working, we didn't want to just like go all in on one place. So we wanted to sample different works in process. So... Over the summer, I was thinking about my, as I, I'm Italian-American, I was thinking about my Italian-American grandmother, and she had, and when you're Italian, you like, on Sundays, you go to a grandma's house, and you eat, everyone calls it pasta, it's an Italian called macaroni, and you eat meatballs and macaroni, and you eat from this big pot of, like, red sauce, right? And my grandmother had this phrase, scorch the pot, which is when you go out there on a Sunday, the food's not ready, it's a little early, it's not time for dinner yet, but you're hungry. And so you go into the pot and you take some of the sauce and you put it on a piece of bread. Or you take some of the pasta before it's ready and you take some of the sauce and you put it on the pasta. And that was scorching the pot. And I thought, that's what we're looking to do. Is we're looking to take pieces of plays that aren't ready yet and have you sample them and have you try them and go, this isn't ready, but eat it. And that's what Scorch the Pot is. Scorch the Pot is us in this room at Mayday Space in Bushwick, this beautiful old church space run by this amazing collective with a kitchen in it, come see these readings of new work that are not finished. And what what is that for you? What is that for you as an audience? What is that for us as artists, as actors? Where is that for us? And be really convivial, really in the kitchen with us. Come get messy with us. And then we had this great idea to have free pasta with it, which is amazing. So yeah, it's a pasta dinner with wine available for purchase. Uh, It's a pasta dinner where you get to see these plays that are still becoming. They're not done. So Sacred Circle created a new series, Scorch the Pot, to showcase the very latest works in progress from writers on the frontier of queer theater. Tonight's edition, for example, will include what Milo and Raymond describe as an apocalyptic collection of shows in various states of completion. There are going to be excerpts from three new plays in process. Um, Each of them is a queer-centric story. Um, There are some really interesting things happening with with gender in, I will say, at least two of them. Um, And this round of Scorch the Pot, there is a big theme of... uh, the future and sort of the dystopic end of the world as we know it, climate change drags us all under kind of vibe coming from... By sheer accident. It's not like we, we no, curated it that that's way. That's what yeah, we got. That's what we got this time around. The event's arguable headliner, though, seems to stand apart. It's an early version of a play that Milo is writing called Suck and Blow, 
which they describe as a kind of radical take on the masculine coming of age story. I have always loved the King Arthur myth. Uh, I was really into it as a kid. I think that these sort of coming of age myths of masculinity are one of the first sets of stories that we sort of give to children growing up, um, children of all genders. I think we're talking like Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, King Arthur, um, even like Holden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye, um, whatever, like Simba and the Lion King. My mom brought that up today. I used to insist on being called Simba as a child. Um, <laughs> that's how you know. Suck and Blow is a concept that Milo and Raymond have been playing with for some time. The mashup of a surprising combination of classical and modern inspirations. On our list of like, maybe eventually was like, all right, the Arthur legend. What if we So set, we've been tossing around the What ideas. if we set the Arthur legend in Bushwick? What if we set the Arthur legend in amongst queer people in Bushwick? And we were like, I guess that's a fine idea, <laughs> right? Like, that seems like something that could work. And, and then nobody was sitting down at a computer to write it. No. And then over the summer, I got really into listening to and reading about the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal that happened in the 90s, right? The President Bill Clinton had this affair with Monica Lewinsky. It came to light through these secret recorded tapes by this woman named Linda Tripp, who was recording her conversations with Monica Lewinsky, and then she turned them over to the FBI. Very intrigue, sex, betrayal, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I pitched to Milo, what if we took the King Arthur legend and the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal, put them together, and set them in, in the contemporary Bushwick queer scene. And I said, I don't know why we would do that. Milo was originally uninterested until they heard about a particular allegation from the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal that involved using a cigar as a sex toy. And to me, when I heard about that detail that I hadn't known prior, just a light bulb went off for me. I was like, oh my God, that's so queer. That's so trans. The notion of taking a disembodied phallic object and using that to have sex is, you know, something trans mask people and, and lots of queer people who weren't born with an organic phallus do all the time. Um, you know, we need props. And so that really set off this chain of thought that was, oh yes, that's a contemporary trans masculine experience. That's also King Arthur pulling the sword out of the stone. There you have another sort of someone who's a kid who's sort of a gender in description. It's a child, right? They're non-sexual. They're non, non-adult, non-gender. And they pull out this big old sword and everyone's like, how did that kid pull out that big old sword? And it just all clicked for me. And I was like, this is a play I'm interested in writing. They describe it as a trans magical realist play that combines elements of the Arthur legend and the Clinton Lewinsky scandal in a story that's set in contemporary Bushwick with LGBTQ characters. I'm gonna have a character who's a mashup of Bill Clinton and King Arthur, and it's a contemporary non-binary trans mask person like myself. And then I'm gonna have a character who is Linda Tripp and Merlin, who's sort of an all-knowing, all-seeing character who is, is making these secret recordings. Um, As with the other Scorch the Pot performances, Suck and Blow is very much a work in progress, and it remains to be seen how the play will explore the more complicated and upsetting dynamics of the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal. But Milo and Raymond sound inspired by the opportunity to flip these inspirations into a story that showcases more fully realized queer and trans coming-of-age experiences than traditional theater typically allows. Yeah, I think another big thing that I was interested in in writing this play was writing a play about queer and trans people having sex. I think that so often, for good reason, it's taboo to do so. Um, and so a lot of the media that depicts, especially trans folks, either hypersexualizes us in a way that inherently makes shame part of what's so titillating about interacting with with the trans body and therefore results in violence or on the other end of the spectrum flatlining sexuality of trans people and making them seem like we're not people who do that and we are you know just like everybody else and so um i wanted to write a piece where that is a big part of the story even if Suck and Blow doesn't sound quite up your alley, the other plays in tonight's showcase sound equally ambitious and surprising. One of them retells the story of Jesus, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus against the backdrop of climate change. Another one is almost, almost a comedy, almost a drama set 10 years in the future in the South Bronx that's been gentrified as the first Category 5 hurricane is about to hit New York City. So it's, it's, 
And there's free pasta. It's a real opportunity to see these plays in their very nascent stages. As much as Scorch the Pot is a celebration of these individual works, it's even more so a celebration of the community, the open yet unbroken circle that the company is building here in Bushwick. Raymond and Milo are joined in Sacred Circle by an eclectic group of theater veterans and newcomers whose skill sets range from modern dance to powerlifting to industrial design. Each member contributes something different, and as Raymond puts it, the company is purpose-built to allow for people to bring the gifts they want to bring and to take the space they need to take. So that means that there are people who are just actors, there are people who do make sort of producing decisions with us, and there are people all in between those people who come in to do a performance here, they might have an an, uh, idea for a new work they want to do in our new work festival, they create stuff with us, and then they take space from us. Or people who want to just be an actor come in and give me this part, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to take it through. And then there are people who like, I want to be in everything you do, I want to help plan this event, I want to not just be the actor, I'm going to stage manage sometimes, I'm going to do some of the more of that getting the room ready for the thing to happen. Those people are the people who we hold closest because they're putting in the most work. While more traditional theater companies might balk at so much fluidity, Sacred Circle embraces it as part of what Raymond and Milo describe as queering the work of theater. Kind of brings us back to this notion of queer ways of working, I think, that We're really interested in diversity of the backgrounds of artists that we work with insofar as um, what skills, what grab bag of skills does each person bring to the table. As counterintuitive as this all may seem to theater goers more accustomed to traditional companies, Sacred Circle sees this diversity as one of its greatest strengths. The people who are in the community are people who want to bring their full skill set to the table. And the people who want to be part of the community are people who want to bring one of their skill sets to the table and then maybe sometimes look at another one of their skill sets. And that's beautiful. And we need all those people at those different levels. Because another queer way of working is... Well, not worrying about who's getting what. Right. A real generosity of resources. And as a sort of a grassroots, a startup organization, so to speak, we are really thankful for and in fact dependent upon the generosity of the people that we work with because none of us are being what under capitalism I would call fairly compensated for our work. So it's more about who is interested in contributing to the community and and watching it grow via their efforts. And that's really beautiful and special. The real power at the heart of the sacred circle, it seems, lies in creating a space that's welcoming for everyone. I'm a really big advocate for, like, queerness can be accessible to anybody. And so people who are questioning, people who are coming into their queer identity, people are coming into their trans identity, people are coming into their non-binary identity. A lot of people, on multiple occasions, we've had people come up to me or you at the end and say, you know, I've never thought about this part of myself. I remember our first event we did at Catland Books, our first queer prom, there was this guy from Long Island who a friend of mine had brought, is one of our uh, lighting designer we'd worked with had brought him, and he was in a dress. And I was like, well, whatever, it's a guy in a dress. And he, he was a like Long Island guy. But then he comes up to me at the end and says to me, I've always kind of wanted to wear a dress, and I don't know what it means, but I've always wanted to, and I felt comfortable here, so thank you. And that's a really important part, I think, of creating community, is like giving people that space. And not gatekeeping. Not gatekeeping, giving people the space with that generosity that you're talking about to explore things. More than anything, Raymond and Milo encourage people, especially those who might think a queer feminist theater isn't for them, to simply check out a show. We are seeking to be a place for a queer space for everyone, not a space for every queer. And that's... A distinction, and I also do want it to be a space for every one. One ink is contained in the other. Does that yes. make sense? Like we do want to be a space for every queer, but also. But I also believe that everyone is queer. So if I believe those two things, then like that's I mean, and that's you could think yourself into a thousand different loops, and that's all word. And then when we make that word into flesh, what that means is we have to sit in that sacred circle with a lot of different people. And I can't just go, oh, not you. I have to welcome you in. And I have to figure out 
why are you like me? Why are you here with me? And that process is scary and it's very vulnerable and it is very much that free fall you were talking about earlier. And that moment for people, if I can give that to them, that's what I want them to leave a Sacred Circle event feeling. You may even want to try stepping into the open yet unbroken Sacred Circle for yourself. We joke in the queer community about the gay agenda, and I think to me what the real gay agenda is, is normalize queerness by inviting people in and living authentically side by side and being kind and and sharing with one another. The two questions that come to my mind are, is your space a queer space? The answer is yes. Do I belong there? The answer is yes. And that tension of we are decidedly a queer space and everyone belongs, that's another one of those tensions that I think is held and disrupted and displaced and made alive and vibrant in that sacred circle. That it is a space big enough for everyone, it is open and yet it is unbroken in that it is a queer space. So you're gonna get something out of that no matter who you are. If you wanna learn more about Sacred Circle, Getting in touch is easy. You should all definitely follow our Instagram. Uh, our Instagram is at Sacred Circle Theater with an R E. Um, we are also on Facebook, Sacred Circle Theater. Uh, if you wanted to reach out via email, our email is Sacred Circle Theater, again with an R E at gmail.com. And other than that, please attend a performance if you can. We always say that the best way to get involved and get to know us is to show up to an event. We are extremely, exceedingly accessible. Come talk to us. I will be taking your tickets at the next event. So if, and literally one of the plays in this Scorch the Pot was someone who attended the first Scorch the Pot. So and yes. And came up to us and Came said, up to us and said, I have a play. And I said, let's meet right now. Right? So it's... It's that easy. It is that easy. But the best way to stay in touch with us is Instagram. At Sacred Circle Theater. With an army. We post a lot. We post a lot. And they're beautiful photos, if I do say so myself. We've got all that info and more in our show notes for this week's episode. We'd like to extend our sincere thanks to Raymond, Milo, and all the people behind Sacred Circle for taking us behind the scenes of the company. Of course, we'd also like to thank you for tuning in this week. If you enjoy Bushwick Podcasts, you can do us a huge favor by telling a friend, or even by leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform, which helps us reach even more new listeners with stories like these. We'll be back next week with another story you won't want to miss. In the meantime, did you know that Bushwick Podcast is made by people just like you? If you have questions, comments, or want to get involved, send us an email to hello at hearbushwick.com. That's H-E-A-R Bushwick dot com. Or you can always DM us on our Instagram page at Bushwick Podcast. We look forward to hearing from you soon, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. 
you know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.